Perfect. Welcome everybody. Um, we'll just get probably start in just about a minute, I think, um, and get underway. Melissa make it back in? Melissa did, and I'm just confirming it is Melanie Kalora is her co-presenter, yes. correct? Excellent. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. All right. So Sheila, just letting you know the time, it is 2.34. I know we are. Yes, I think we'll just get going. Yeah. Uh, so welcome everybody. Um, make sure you're in the correct place. This is the social emotional learning indicator system or CELIS as we call it uh, webinar. Um, this coming together to hear from five districts that have participated in the CELIS project um, for the last two years and uh, we're going to hear from these uh, wonderful um, educators. And I'm going to keep uh, my introduction very brief. I will start off just giving an introduction, just hopefully to give you enough context about what uh, you're going to see uh, or background information about what you're going to see um, in the presentation. So just a little flavor of uh, a summary of the project. I'll be followed by uh, Melissa McGuire, who's uh, the Director of Student Services and Milani Koyura, hope I'm saying that right, who's a school adjustment counselor for Monomoy Regional School District. Uh, this will be followed by a question and answer uh, between myself and uh, Dr. Linda Watt, who is the school psychologist for Taunton Public Schools. Um, then we'll have uh, Kim Garrison, who's a behavioral health coordinator and research specialist at Martha's Vineyard Public Schools. She will be followed by John Crocker, who is director of uh, school mental health and behavior services at Methuen Public Schools. And then lastly, but not least, we have Dr. Chris Lord, who's the executive director of remote learning and external relations at Peabody. Uh, public schools. So welcome everybody and I will get going with uh, giving you some context to the CELIS project. So here uh, we have like a, the evolution of the CELIS project. Um, it really actually began like happenstance, uh, just like 
uh, I uh, was co I was paired with uh, Melissa McGuire from Monomoy at a Safe and Supportive Schools conference. She was presenting on uh, her social emotional learning strategic planning and initiatives in the district, and I was presenting on the uh, views of climate and learning, which is the DESE School Climate Survey. And we just got talking afterwards and she expressed uh, some frustration about, you know, not knowing whether she was making a difference with all the initiatives that she had in, in related to social emotional learning in the district. And of course, I'm doing measurement at uh, the agency. So we kind of got together and started collaborating on how to measure uh, social emotional learning, uh, student social emotional learning. Um, and basically the CELIS um, is a student self-assessment of the social emotional skills. So we managed to get a fall administration done in 2018. 2019, um, Monomoy administered it twice. So we get fall and the spring, so see where they started in the year and where they ended up in the year. And then in that year, we also did some uh, item development to try and improve the reliability and uh, validity of the survey. In 2021, that's when we expanded the project, but still at a pilot phase. And we were funded by a grant integrating SEL into academic learning we onboarded 10 districts and we did a spring administration and DESI provided some trainings around the content of the survey and some analysis uh, training. And then in 2021, we lost two districts, but we have eight districts uh, staying for the second year of the pilot and they did a fall in the spring. And Melissa's Monomar group, although they're not quite in the cellist, project, they continue to do um, fall and spring administrations right throughout uh, the COVID pandemic. And then now we're at 2022, and there's going to be a new grant opportunity, uh, which will be posted soon. And we'll be looking to onboard another eight to 10 districts to support them in the administration of the assessment and continue to try and support the pilot cohort one districts, as I call them. So, so the survey is based on the CASELS framework. CASELS, the Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning. And it's, as I said, a student self-assessment and they're rating how hard or easy they find certain skills. But the conceptual framework is CASELS. It's called the CASELS 5. And it's looking at intrapersonal skills, which are the self-awareness and self-management skills of students. It's looking at social awareness and relationship skills, which are more interpersonal. And it's also looking at responsible decision-making. And these, what you have in front of you is the definitions. So in terms of the content, there's probably more of an emphasis in the assessment on self-awareness, self-management in terms of the intrapersonal, because they have um, more uh, topic areas that need to be covered to assess them properly. So in those areas, we're just looking at do students understand their emotions, thoughts, behaviors, and they are able to manage them. In the interpersonal skills, we're looking at their ability to understand other perspectives in different settings, and whether they form healthy and supportive relationships. And then in responsible decision-making, we're looking at their ability um, for, you know, to make responsible, caring, constructive choices um, in different contexts as well, in different situations. So you know, those of you who are familiar with the castle wheel, this is the inner core. We're very much focused on the inner core of that castle wheel. And it's uh, very specific, just looking at these five core competencies. So here's some examples of uh, the items that we're using to measure the five core competencies. 
And the students respond um, to these item stems and they have four options. They can rate whether they find the skill being asked about very easy, easy, hard or very hard. The total number of items um, for the younger grades is 45. For the middle school grades, we have 48 items. And for the high school grades, we have um, 50 items. But across all of the grades, there are 41 common items. So students respond to these 41 items independent of what grade they're in. I have to say that the, the uh, survey is premised on the social emotional competency assessment, which was developed by uh, researchers from the University of Illinois and Castle, and also by practitioners from Washoe County in um, Nevada District. So the base of the survey is um, from them. And then we've done some tweaking, just as I said, to improve the reliability and validity. But this is essentially the types of uh, questions the students respond to. In terms of reporting, we have two types of data. So we create um, a scaled score based on students' responses and districts and schools receive um, an overall score, which is premised on all item responses that the students made. And then they get a score for each individual student for self-assessment, the self-management score, a social awareness score, relationship skills score, and a responsible decision-making score. So they have information about their overall and the five dimensions. The scale is uh, the students are put, uh, responses are put on the scale, a scaled score that ranges from one to 999. Um, what we did is we analyzed the data district by district, but mostly uh, in all districts, the average score on that scale is around about 500. But with most students, um, scores ranging between four and six, 400 and 600. The other type of data we provide is a data visualization map of students' responses. So it's each individual student's response in a map. And these are asset-based maps that highlight students' social-emotional strengths, and then also areas in need of support and development based on their response. And the idea is that we highlight the strengths and we leverage those strengths to help support the areas in need of growth. So these, um, you'll see examples of these, I think, in the presentations. So this is the two types of data that um, the districts and schools have received. This is just to give you a sense. This is from our spring 2022 administration across the 10 districts, um, so 18,000 students. We just divided up the, the uh, scale uh, to get a sense of the distribution of the levels of uh, social emotional competence in the schools. And uh, we have, Roughly about 2% who are what we call emerging SEL skills. 32% or a third of students have developing uh, SEL skills. Uh, about half of the students have developed SEL skills and uh, roughly 10% have highly developed. So if they score over 600, um, they're considered highly developed SEL skills. So it just gives you a sense. And this actually distribution is pretty well across the board in every, of, every one of the uh, um, 10 or eight to 10 districts we have, very similar. So once the districts and schools uh, receive their data, then I think this is a really nice framework um, to use to support the data use. So we have the multi-tiered system of support framework it uh, uses data to inform the types of supports that can be provided to students in the schools and what level of support. So if the student is uh, needing increasing te uh, intensity of support, that is almost like one-on-one -on -one or very small group uh, support, and that's called tier three. 
So the Celis data does fit into this framework rather nicely. So example, you could use uh, the aggregate scores of students, say if you have maybe a literacy program that you have provide extra support to the students, you could take their scores and average and look at your profile of their social emotional skills and look to see how you could target supports to help them not only with their literacy development, but their social emotional development. It doesn't just have to be like females versus males. The SWAN maps, uh, the, um, the individual student maps, um, I initially thought they would be very ideal for tier three for one-on-one -on -one intensive support and inform that um, interventions or supports uh, for these students. But as Melissa will, uh, from Monomoy will show, she's actually used it at a tier one level. So it's, it's kind of interesting. But it, this is a very nice framework in which to think about how are we going to use the uh, CELIS data to drive decisions and monitor the progress of uh, students. Then just quickly, uh, just to give you some resources, I want to mention again the grant uh, that will be posted shortly. Um, we'll bring on another cohort of districts to support uh, in administering the CELIS. Um, there's a CELIS web page. It's pretty rudimentary, but uh, you'll see some of the uh, all the item prompts there. And we have some uh, interpretive materials that will help you interpret the scores at different parts of uh, the scaled score for each of the dimensions. And then I just wanted to highlight the MTSS academies because they really focus on the social, emotional, and behavioral well being of students and how to support them using the SEL and PBIS frameworks. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight those opportunities, the professional development opportunities coming up. And this is just the references for the actual developers of uh, the, the uh, original survey that we based our CELIS survey on. And without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing and hand over to Melissa McGuire, who's the Director of Student Services at Monomoy. Thanks, Sheila. Gonna... Oh, did you give me sharing? Oh, there it is. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I have to um, just say, Sheila, thank you so much. It's been an awesome ride with you over the last uh, few years and, um, you know, really developing what I think is, is just a great system. Um, so I'm going to be brief because my colleague Melanie has some amazing um, information to share. But what I really wanted to stress first is that, you know, this really starts from a strategic vision. And part of the strategic planning process, in, in my mind, it's critical to have a social emotional um, well-being focus or part of our goal, and which it is in Monomoy. So this is really helpful because it allows us to really look at the district and be able to support all of our schools um, in this endeavor. And as Sheila said, we, we subscribe to the, the Castle Five most definitely, um, and a few examples of how we really address the five core competencies um, throughout our four schools and all of our grades is with PBIS, we use second step pre-K to four, we use bot and life skills, we use our bullying prevention, which um, several different uh, curricula that we use, we use zones of regulation, believe it or not, all the way up to the high school, we're using zones of regulation. Um, check in, check out. Um, we have an SEL integration team. We do some other uh, peer mentoring, silent mentors, three for three, and those are all really supporting kids um, that really require support, but we don't really necessarily want them to know that we're providing that support. Um, and then this year, we've actually had, we have therapy dogs in, in all four of our schools. But Melanie's going to really um, talk about more intricate uh, supports that are in the school. Melissa, Melissa, yes. can you hang on one second. We need to switch the interpreters. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so we're ready. Go ahead. All right. So one of the things that um, I created was kind of a vision of, of what do we want to use the CELIS data for? 
And so we kind of created this matrix that looked at once we have those data, how are we going to use them? So certainly because we're doing a fall and spring administration, we can do some comparisons and I'm going to show you two quick maps in, in a second. And then what we wanted to do is use it to highlight struggling students and then highlight relationship skills because that's been a heavy emphasis in our district is um, the relationship skills um, competency. And then looking at what uh, SEL interventions do we need to design and then setting some student goals. And I'm going to show you a very simple because in my mind sometimes simple really is the best um, goal sheet that we created and, and work with some of our students with. Also looking at your student support team is bringing those CELUS data um, anytime you know, a student is referred uh, to the SST uh, team or whatever you, you call your student support team. Anytime there's a discipline, uh, behavioral, or any levels of absenteeism, um, we're always pulling the maps out. You know, we want to say, you know, where was this kid at? What was this kid thinking? And making sure that we're using those data to really cross-reference anything that's going on. Certainly at 504 and IEP meetings for class placements, guidance uses those to really support students in their junior and senior years and planning and again goal setting. So this is this is just the vision and um, we're not doing all of this 100%, we're doing a lot of it. Um, and so the goal is to continue to reach all of these um, markers in this matrix. And this is a quick example, only because I know another district is going to show a map, but this is an example of the fall administration on the left and the spring administration this year um, for one student. And certainly what we're looking at is um, the areas that are developed and, you know, looking at the strengths and moving up. And what I was noticing on, you know, this particular student, even in a year, which honestly I think has been just as tough as last year and when we were out for COVID, that we're seeing some really nice movement um, with students. And what we try to focus on, and Melanie can talk about this as well, is we try to focus on, you know, not the areas that we're working on to develop, that my conversation with a student is, you know, I, I see that these things were really hard for you. But what I'm really noticing up here is you've got some great strengths. So let's build on those and see if we can't make these things here that are tough a little easier for you and having those conversations. Um, and I believe another district is going to show that when you have these maps, um, and I don't have it on this particular one, but when you put your cursor over any of these indicators, the question actually pops up. So it's pretty cool to be able to really see what were those questions, especially down in this area um, that were a struggle. This is our really simple goal sheet. I'm a big believer of three. I'm always saying I need at least three data points of, for something. But here, you know, really looking at what are some three areas that I would like to work on and what are those strategies that I can use um, to meet that goal. And now, because I really want to give the floor to Melanie, she's just done some amazing work. And um, Melanie, you can take it away and uh, I will uh, move the slides for you. All right, thank you so much, Melissa, for that introduction. Um, so as she said, my name is Mel Kalora and I am a school adjustment counselor at Harwich Elementary School. Melissa, if you wanna go to the next slide, great. And so over these next 15 or so minutes, I'm just gonna walk you through um, and really share how my team here at Harwich Elementary School put the CELIS into action and how it really informed our interventions for our students who were more on the emerging and at risk um, categories. I also wanna talk about leveraging data. So how can we get the most out of the data that we have? and also using the tools and systems that we already have in place, as well as ensuring that the resources that we have are allocated not only efficiently, but making sure that it's equitable, excuse me, equitable as well. Go to the next screen. So before I really talk about the CELIS and how we used it this year, I want to share a brief overview of the social emotional learning approach that we have here at Harwich Elementary School. Some of you may be familiar with the Sabres conceptual model. Um, what I did is I took that model because I think it did a really, really nice job of, of highlighting the differences between social behavior, emotional behavior. Um, and then you can see in the right-hand corner, there's 
a little picture of academic behavior. For the sake of this presentation, I'm not going to go over that. I'm really going to focus on sort of the social and emotional piece. So here at Howard Elementary School, we do use a whole child approach because it, again, it does a nice job of helping to identify you know, the different interventions that a student might need that are aligned with what their presenting challenge is. You know, I, as a school adjustment counselor, I am providing direct services and it, it makes me think of if there are any Oprah fans here, you know, she's like, you get this, you get that. And it's like, you get a lunch bunch. No, you get a lunch bunch. And, you know, lunch bunch isn't always the answer to all of our students, um, you know, presenting challenges. And so this model, it really is what I have used um, to really, you know, ensure that the interventions we're using are aligned with what the behaviors are. So again, this is an infographic about the systems that we did put in place, or rather the systems that we already have in place. Um, you know, the CELIS along with other universal screeners, we use the SSIS as well here, which I will talk a little bit more about. Um, it really helps us to make those database decision making. And so I'm just gonna walk you through this infographic. So, you know, the first step is the kids taking that CELIS screener. Again, we also utilize the SSIS, which is teacher-based. Um, once we get that data information from the screeners, what we're doing is really reviewing it and making sure that data is aggregated. Here at Harwich, both myself and the school psychologists work together to make sure we were putting um, you know, this information together. And what that did is we really highlighted the emerging and at-risk students, which again, in the next two screens, I will show you an example of what that looks like and kind of like what Melissa said, it's very, very simple, simple is good. Um, and so once we have identified those emerging or at-risk students, we do meet weekly, um, our support team, it consists of myself, so the school adjustment counselor, our school psychologists, our school nurse, as along with both of our administrators and the special educator. And, and this piece is really important because, you know, the data that we're getting from these screeners are absolutely incredible. And what we do as a team is, you know, we each have different lenses, different perspectives, different relationships with the students. So we, we review each and every student and we're really, you know, taking it and, and really breaking down the whole child profile. Once we have done that, we divide and conquer and we consult with the teacher to say, this is the information we got. Does this really fit the student that you see in class or not? And then again, another extremely important piece is the student check-in part. And I think um, particularly with the CELIS, since that's a student self-report, you know, to check in with the students, particularly those students who had identified, um, you know, challenges in specific areas and really giving them sort of a sense of agency and, and being a part of discussion about their plan and, and their support plan. Um, and one thing I do want to highlight is what we did is we, once we got the data, we really did this in about two to three weeks, a two to three week time frame from when we gave the screeners to when the intervention was identified. Not necessarily when the intervention started, but at least when the intervention identified. Um, so as I mentioned, this is a really simple example. I use an Excel spreadsheet to um, you know, aggregate that data and really highlight. So you'll see um, you know, the green, the yellow, and the red. So if we're familiar with that, the, the tiered systems approach, you know, green are our more tier one students, yellow, tier two, red, tier three. Okay. And so what I really like about the, the CELIS is that you know, as, as people were mentioning who presented before me is that this is student self-report. So they're, this is based on their perspective, okay? And what I absolutely love about this, you know, as someone who is providing services for social, emotional, and, and mental health challenges is that it really does help to identify our students 
who are more internalizers. You know, we all know that students who have uh, more acting out behaviors, they're easily identifiable. However, our students who are um, less of acting out, really internalizing their emotions, it, it helps to highlight that. Um, so these students who typically might fly under the radar are identified. And, and this piece in particular was really um, powerful in my consultations with teachers because I would say, so does this really fit what you see in the classroom? And some teachers were like, no, I really had no idea that the student felt that way. So that's really, you know, the important piece of following up with the teacher and more importantly, following up with the student to say, you know, we see that this is hard for you and really making a plan to support them. And again, the CELIS fits in really nicely with the SSIS. I don't know if you are familiar with that, but this, this is a teacher-based um, universal screener. And again, this is a very simple example of how I aggregated that data. I used an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so one tab, it had the CELIS information, and then the second tab was the SSIS data. Um, and so we do, when the CELIS is given and when the SSIS is completed, they do coincide with one another. So we're getting this more complete whole child approach picture of a student's social emotional learning profile. And we do that intentionally because we want all of that information to really help inform um, our interventions. And what I really wanna focus on this page is the last column um, on the right-hand side where you see tiered support slash interventions. And that really goes back to the piece where I was talking about, you know, using the interventions that we already have available in school, making sure that those interventions are allocated in an equitable way. Um, sometimes students, particularly those with more of the acting out externalized behaviors, they can often be over identified. And those students who are more internalizers might not necessarily have um, an intervention assigned to them. And so using the CELIS along with the SSIS, um, you know, really ensures that we, we are meeting all students' needs and, and ensuring that each student gets some intervention equitably. Okay. We've already seen some example of this. And so we also use the MTSS framework or approach to really help us inform that appropriate tiered intervention. So we know tier one, all students get tier one intervention. And these are just some examples of what we have here at Harwich Elementary School. So, you know, PBIS is very, very big at the elementary level. Um, you know, we use the zones of regulation and second step, as Melissa had mentioned, the CELIS and the SSIS, um, you know, also teacher classroom management systems. Some of the information that we, we got from the CELIS, even if a student wasn't necessarily identified as emerging or at risk, but was approaching one of those categories, really sort of working with the teacher on the tier one sort of whole classroom wide, um, you know, systems to really help address the needs. And in particular, if we're seeing a large number of students from one classroom, you know, I've heard of it as called like tier one plus, um, you know, so working with that teacher to really refine those those classroom management skills. Um, we have our core values and lessons here that we do in the beginning of the year and we reteach as needed. Again, morning meeting, responsive classroom, those are all tier one interventions. Um, so again, using this approach does really help to provide that framework to, uh, to inform the appropriate intervention. So looking at the screening data, um, we're making sure that it's aligned to the actual need. So kind of going back to my joke about everyone gets a lunch bunch, right? We're not gonna give a student a lunch bunch for social skills if they're more uh, in need of emotional regulation skill building. So it's really just attaching and assigning interventions that make sense that are addressing that need to help the student move forward and you know, hopefully eventually be able to be back in the tier one supports. Um, you know, one thing that I myself have experienced is that um, you know, doing these screeners and, and some feedback I've heard from others is that there can be concerns about 
over identifying a student or really having too many students to service right because we are public education and we are our resources are finite right and so i want to highlight that not all interventions have to be direct services so that's why it was really helpful for us to really use this triangle to assign different types of interventions. Again, it could be working with the teacher for classroom management skills. It could be, um, as Melissa mentioned, we have an SST process, which that is our um, basically our RTI approach to intervention. And so there's a number of things that you can um, use for an intervention that do not necessarily mean direct services. All right, thank you, Melissa. Okay. Actually, Melissa, would you mind going back to that other slide? Um, and can you click, is there a link on, if you click on the triangle? Okay. This is just really an example that I wanted you guys to, to have. Again, we talked about um, CASEL and the learning and life competencies, competencies. All of these go hand in hand. So while I'm not specifically talking about those competencies, um, we really do marry all of these systems and approaches together and it does work very nicely so these are just some examples again about different resources and interventions it's also a way to ensure that these things are done with fidelity and that they're being monitored so i just wanted to give examples of something that i have used in my previous school that i was able to bring to monomoy and really marry it with the CELIS, the SSIS, and all the wonderful work that we're doing here. Thank you, Melissa. All right. And so I'm just going to read these um, few sentences. Incorporating universal screeners such as the CELIS and the SSIS into an MTSS framework ensures that districts have the appropriate data and the right practices in place to ensure a whole child approach in supporting our student success using those existing interventions and supports. The system establishes a structured process allowing educators to focus on the tier one SEL supports aligned to the needs of all students while also analyzing data that really drives impactful tier two and tier three interventions to support our students who are more at risk. And so what I hope I've shed a light on throughout my presentation is that, you know, particularly in Massachusetts, we are definitely very privileged that many schools have a wealth of interventions available and, and utilizing a systems approach really allows what feels like a monumental task to be broken down into something that is more manageable. And most importantly is that we are putting in place meaningful and effective interventions to really address the whole child and to meet those needs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you both. That was lovely. Um, does anybody, if people are going to ask, uh, maybe get one question in because we're short of time, but if anybody has a question, can they just put it in the chat, please? No questions at the moment, Sheila. All right. So just uh, if you think of something that you'd like to ask, please just put it in the chat and we'll make sure it's answered either now or um, after the after the presentation. I'll, I'll make sure I get the answers to the questions. So, um, so we're going to share so much... all resources, correct, Sheila? We will share slides. Yes. Resources. Correct. Yes. Yep. Um, okay, so our next um, presenter, well, it's not presenter because we're going to change that up a little. We're going to do a question and answer uh, between myself and Dr. Linda Watt, who's a school psychologist for Taunton. And um, just so that the questions are accessible, I have them on the screen. So Linda, <laughs> uh, why did your district decide to apply for the CELIS grant in 2020? And what was the need that the CELIS data could help address? So our district was lucky on several different layers. Um, prior to the grant being posted, uh, we had already created a social emotional um, learning 
community input team. And as part of that team, we had started to look at social emotional data and looking at screenings and looking at curriculum. Melissa McGuire became um, available at different points. She came and spoke to our social emotional um, community input team, but also she had done, I'm not sure how um, Judy Mulroney, who used to be our director of special education, she had connected with Judy at different points and times. And we were involved in some of the development of the questions of the CELIS. So when the grant became available, um, we readily applied because it was right in line for the work that we were doing. And we thought it would help us start to address kind of the missing gaps that we noted in Taunton, where we hadn't really had too much data with regard to where our student skills were at um, when we started the social emotional community input team. Thank you. Um, so when Taunton joined the CELUS project in 2020-2021, it administered CELUS in the four required grades. So what happened is that we required um, students to administer in the grade, same grades um, that the vocal school climate, DESI's vocal school climate survey is, just for our own research purposes. Um, so there was grade four, five, eight, and 10. So what went into the decision to start with just the four grades and then in 2021-22 you expanded to um, grades three through 12 and what factors sort of uh, helped you decide to expand in that second year? We The factors that went into it was the information that we were able to to gather from the first administration. Um, I think we were underestimating um, the results and what information we would be getting from the CELIS data. And when we saw what the data was able to give us, inclusive of the intersectionality with um, students' SES, students' um, culture, ethnicity, all of that other information, it was a wealth of information that we felt was important for us to have for more students. So when we decided to expand, we decided to do it for all grade levels that we could possibly do it for so that we could gather all that data um, and be able to utilize that data across the district. So Taunton has 11 schools in the district. Um, what do you need to set up the district to be able to successfully administer CELIS in your schools? I mean, like the logistics, the people, the other resources that you might need to be able to take on such an administration? Lots of ADHD people. I guess. Um, so basically, <laughs> what you know, it, it was a very big undertaking when we went to the the large administration. Um, what we really needed, what was the most important, I feel like, um, was the buy-in from our uh, central office staff and then the administration in the buildings. Without the buy-in from the administrators, it was very difficult. It would be very difficult in order to get the administration done in the way that it needed to be done in a systematic way. Um, I also was able to create from the social emotional learning um, community input team, I created a kind of subset of that group who then were able to support me in kind of figuring out how to administer it, where, what, when we were going to administer it and what the logistics were of that. So I do have a small team of people who work on that kind of logistical piece along with our fabulous um, tech department who does help with the data collection piece. Um, thanks. Um, how do you use the cells data in your uh, district and who uses it and how do you actually use it as your role as a school psycho psychologist and what kinds of decisions does the data help inform? So I can say I don't use it as my role as a school psychologist because I'm using it as I, I tend to oversee a, a lot of the social emotional uh, learning initiatives here in the district. So that's kind of where I'm using the data. Um, who uses the data currently um, are administrators, uh, school counselors, and the kind of student support teams within the school buildings. 
and what they're using it for are very similar to the probably earlier stages of Monomoy. They're kind of our target. Um, but the earlier stages, which is looking at um, the data to help us with class placements, to help us look at those tiered interventions. So which, you know, we implemented a tier one intervention across the district th um, this past year. So really starting to look at how this data can inform our tier two and our tier three interventions with regard to the social emotional functioning of the students. So we've been very um, lucky to be able to start to use it this way because we have a lot of data. The other piece that we're also using it to do is starting to use it to inform our restorative practices when it comes to um, discipline, absenteeism, um, office referrals, things like that, really looking at the restorative practices. So if a student has um, these areas of strengths or these areas of weakness, and they're having this type of behavior in school, how are we, what are we able to implement in our restorative practices that support their strengths, but also help them where their weaknesses are at. And um, how do you plan to use the data going forward? Well, I've been very lucky to be part of kind of all of these uh, informational sessions that you've been doing over the years. So we have kind of our, our kind of going forward plan includes using the SWOON data um, in our middle and our high schools uh, during their advisory periods and really starting to educate the students about their own strengths and how to utilize their strengths with regard to kind of their emerging skills. Um, and then we're also planning on using it to then cross section it with um, a universal mental health screener that we are implementing um, this year. So the idea is, you know, I, I kind of, I think we're following behind Bonamoy's path, hopefully, and we're getting to, we're learning from them. Um, and the plan is to continue to kind of adapt what we're doing to kind of model very similarly what they're doing. And it's been a really nice journey. And it's been really nice to have someone like Melissa and Monomoy to kind of pave the way because there's a nice pathway for us to follow um, and have ideas of what we can do with the data going forward. All right. Um, does anybody have any questions uh, for Linda or Dr. Watt? You have just put them in the chat. Uh, shy folks today. Words of support from Melissa. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So next up, thanks, Linda. Uh, why is my advanced button not working very well? Mm -hmm. ah, um, we have uh, Kim Garrison, um, who's the Behavioral Health Coordinator and Research Specialist for uh, Martha's uh, Vineyard Public Schools. So I'll just advance. So she's going to work off this slide. Thank you, Sheila. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and to join this larger conversation about the SELIS because I think it's a, a, a gift to our school systems in Massachusetts and beyond. Um, so here at Martha's Vineyard Public Schools, we had a large um, evaluation that was done in 2018. Um, and it was specifically focused on all aspects of youth well-being. So school-based mental health, um, health curriculum, social emotional learning, it, school climate, it covered really all components of safe and supportive schools. And basically the recommendations that came from that report um, are A, one of the reasons why I have a job currently because the recommendation was to have a behavioral health coordinator. Um, but specifically, it recommended that our school system focus on improving school climate, um, improving our SEL programming, and increasing the access to behavioral health services. So I entered Martha's Vineyard Public Schools at a time where I say we were really starting to build the culture of social emotional learning, um, and we are still in the initial phases a few years later. Um, and the CELIS came in really in my second year of my work, and I grabbed it because of the various reasons that I'll speak of um, today. So 
I wanted to kind of deviate from, I know all of the awesome technical pieces that my colleagues before me brought into this presentation. And I wanted to kind of step out and talk a little bit also about like the ecology of social emotional learning in our school systems, because that's one thing that Castle really does talk about is that it is um, not just focused internally on the skill sets of the, the student, but also to think about all of the characteristics that surround that student um, within the school, around the school and the community. And so in building our culture of SEL and the role that Celis has played, um, I look at evaluation, I'm looking at equity, I'm looking at culture, I'm looking at planning and resource allocation and practice, which are components that everyone has touched on before me. Um, so as far as equity is concerned, um, what I was really trying to focus in on on our recommendations was finding something that provided our students a voice. Um, we, do, we did use um, the SISS for a couple of years, and then also we have some other observation, teacher observation tools that we're using um, in our various different schools. Everybody was kind of doing a little bit of every, something different, um, which we still are. But nothing was really promoting the voice of students and how they saw their own skill sets. Um, and I thought that that was a really wonderful opportunity for us to get students involved and engaged in how we are supporting them and also how we're developing our systems, our programs and our services to meet their social emotional um, learning needs. So that was one of the aspects of um, equity that I really wanted to point out. On the flip side, after doing our first year of the CELIS, an outcome related to equity really was the fact that in the analysis, it, um, we're able to see discrepancies of subgroups. And that was another piece of, I think, the cultural responsiveness that the CELIS can bring in is starting to see how do special populations or subgroups within our um, student enrollment, how do they actually see themselves and their strengths around these social emotional competencies? So always remembering that it's not just the skill sets that we put out to measure of students, but what they find of value and how they make meaning of them um, in their own identities. And so that's something that we're using the CELIS data is we actually just recently used it to inform our Student Opportunity Act goals. And so using the discrepancies between some special populations, we can focus in on specific SEL supports that we can develop here. Um, as far as culture is concerned, it, in building a culture of SEL, it, it was quite obvious to me when I came into the Martha's Vineyard Public Schools that everybody kind of had a different working definition of what social emotional learning was, ranging from anything related to mental health to emotional disturbance um, identifications, and really just to anything that was supportive of students um, beyond just academics. So what I really appreciated is that in order to actually promote a shared culture and understanding, we had a working definition from the castle that was tied to items specifically that students were using to start to make sense of what social emotional learning and skill sets are for them, but also how um, teachers and adults in the school and students are understanding them together. So we have a shared language when we talk about self-awareness or when we talk about self-management. Um, and so that was another really important piece for me that I continue to utilize the CELIS for. As far as planning and resource allocation is concerned, um, we didn't really have a lot beyond our large scale evaluations of ongoing data to inform strategic planning. So a lot like Melissa was talking about in her strategic planning with Monomoy, um, I've been able to really use each individual school's CELIS data to make recommendations for maybe some areas that they could spend their ESSER funds um, and what specific um, interventions or programming, um, especially at tier two, that's a big focus for us right now, would be relevant. Um, to our students as far as how they're reporting out their skill sets. And then the last that I will highlight is our practice. And this is the one that I'm focusing on most. Um, I think it's kind of my own research bend too, 
um, coming from an instructional background and now being in my coordinating role, I really find value in making sure that we're integrating this data into the classroom and academic learning. So we're using it to really promote um, the integration into academic instruction. So currently I am working with our ninth grade team to take the CELIS data and to use um, a framework um, around using understanding by design for unit planning that continues to utilize SEL data to put in, um, to promote student strengths, whether it's around cooperative learning or problem solving and to identify certain strategies that will be relevant to that specific class and then to differentiate that across different classes, um, which is relatively new idea for our high school because um, SEL, as we know, at the high school level um, is a little less um, directed and it's a little bit more in, um, incorporated into the student's experience across all aspects of their academic um, life. And then last, what I did down here um, was I took the castle definition because often in building this culture of, of SEL in Martha's Junior Public Schools and being able to talk about the five domains that Celis measures, um, I often throw out the castle definition. And it's because it's still a relatively new concept that our school community is starting to um, hold on to and commonly discuss. It is very difficult to conceptualize what it means to um, support students in knowledge, skills, and attitudes around healthy identities, or to support students in knowledge, skills, and attitudes around um, feeling and showing empathy for others. So that language still is a little abstract for many practitioners um, based on the CASEL definition, but I'm able to kind of say, oh, we're talking about healthy identities. Well, we know when we look at the CELIS, we know also we're talking about self-awareness. So we can start to take the CASEL definition and make it a little bit more concrete so that we can use that data then to inform our practice moving forward. So we're still in our you know, initial phases and we have pockets of teams that are using the data at different levels. Um, and we're just really still trying to figure out how is our system going to come together. So I really appreciate all of my colleagues who came before me and I open up to any questions that anybody has. All right. Okay, don't seem to have any questions. Um, we'll move forward. Thank you, Kev, very much. Appreciate it. Um, so next up, if my screen would advance, we have uh, John Crocker. He's the Director of School Mental Health and Behavioral Services at Methuen Public Schools. I will stop sharing so that he can share. There we go. Hey, everybody. Glad to see you here today. Really appreciate it. Uh, I am here to talk about how we incorporated CELIS into our screening program. So it's a little bit of a different, um, a little bit of a different perspective that we're taking. We screened for mental health concerns for a number of years before incorporating CELIS. CELIS has really allowed for us to take a look at the entire continuum of social uh, or psychosocial data, social emotional data. So that we're not just focusing on symptom presentation, but we're also uh, sensitive to the pro-social measurement that is so important to be able to understand student growth and to be able to understand the impact of our services um, on those social emotional competencies. So this is the definition that we're operating from. This use of a tool or process employed with an entire population. I will just you know, give the caveat that I don't think you get to universal screening overnight, certainly not with symptom-specific measures. Um, I think it's important that we are sensitive to the scale of our implementation and that we are uh, moving at the right speed to be able to react to the mental health screening data that we collect. Certainly with CELIS data, it's <clears throat> less of a response required immediately compared to something 
for example, like a depression screener, but it is still data that needs to be responded to. So woven throughout this presentation, I will reference the scale of implementation and, um, and provide a little bit of uh, insight into how you can get CELUS or depression or anxiety screening off the ground in a safe way that is sensitive to the readiness of your staff to be able to react to that data. These are the components um, of universal social emotional learning or mental health screening that I think are so critical to orient to. Um, I'm going to guess that for those of you that have implemented any degree of screening, you've got a team supporting that, and that's essential. No one's going it alone with a process like this. We're looking for buy-in from school and community stakeholders so that we can feel good about what we're doing and know that we're going to be supported in ultimately collecting these data. PD and technical assistance uh, to ensure social emotional learning and mental health staff are ready to receive that data, to use that data, to understand its application in real time. You do have to pick a population to screen. There are all kinds of questions related to that. Are you looking for point in time transition, say grades seven to eight, four to five? Are we looking to get ahead of problems in a really proactive way? Let's screen early. Um, you have to pick a measure. In this case, we're talking about CELUS, but when you are incorporating CELUS into a larger screening program, you have lots of other measures to choose from that will ultimately allow for you to look at symptoms decreasing over time while you fade services and social emotional competence increasing over time while you fade services. That's the goal, to be able to look at pro-social measurement alongside symptom-specific measurement and watch that cross-cutting data set. You do need adoption, uh, to adopt some consent procedures. Um, that's essential for any kind of screening. Planning for the day of, data collection, analysis, and warehousing. I think as we move forward with CELUS, there's the big question of like, where do we put these data? Where are we warehousing them? How do we store them? What happens when these kids graduate? Where does this go? So questions there. And then um, certainly conducting a coordinated follow-up to address the needs of students um, I heard a lot of great examples today of the ways in which these data have been leveraged to be able to point students at appropriate interventions. Really appreciate that. These data are actionable. Please don't screen for the sake of screening. It's super unethical. These are the major components of our much larger screening system. So social, emotional, mental health screening is part of our comprehensive school mental health system. What is that? It's another tiered system of support. It is oriented to universal supports like SEL and mental health literacy for all, and then group-based and individual therapy at tiers two and three, programmatic um, services such as our bridge program and coordination with outside mental health agencies to augment what we do. We do K-12 screening multiple times per year. CELUS is in fall and spring, following the trend we have of spring, uh, fall and spring screening for our mental health screening. Um, I highlighted in blue here, this is so critical to, to highlight as we unpack CELUS, social emotional competence is being measured by CELUS so we can get a more comprehensive data set and not only understand symptom specific data, but also the pro-social data that is a function of good services for kids and good curriculum delivery in the land of social emotional learning. Um, our measures exclusively rely on student self-report. The reason for that is that I can't guess how Kim feels. I need to ask how Kim feels. Um, it is bad science when we try and guess at how people think, feel. Um, it's just not a, it's not a reliable, valid way of getting at, um, at affect. So when we dip our toes into the land of mood-related psychosocial data, we really have to go to the source, and that's our kids. Um, otherwise, we run the risk of greater reliability problems, of bias, of culturally irresponsible practice. Passive consent with opt-out procedures is what we have adopted. Basically, we're saying, we're going to do this thing, tell us not to. And less than 1% of our parent population ultimately push back, or not even push back, but just opt out. And that's OK. They don't have to engage. Um, we do use web-based tools, Google tools. CELUS is supported by DESI. We truly appreciate that. We're going through Alchemer for, um, for the CELUS. Um, students in the moderate to severe range receive follow-up. Any report of suicidal ideation or self-harm is immediate follow-up. And who's doing this stuff? Like who is administering 
all of these measures. Well, it's our school-based staff. We've really championed in the film that we want our school-based mental health staff, our school counselors, our school social workers and adjustment counselors, our school psychologists using evidence-based therapeutic practices and using evidence-based data collection and psychosocial data progress monitoring practices. This is what we screen for in Methuen. We screen for an awful lot across a lot of grade levels. Um, we're using closed gap as a, uh, a general mood rating for our youngest kids. And we start in on use of Celis in grade three. We, we did administer this to grade 12 students once last year, but primarily, and I think moving forward, we're going to use Celis with grades three through 11. It allows for us to be able to get um, a really long view of the social emotional competence of our kids over time, um, which I think has been just fantastic. I do need some audience participation for this question. If you already know the answer, then you are excluded from this question, but what is the national average wait time for a student to receive services after the onset of a mental health problem? The average national wait time, what do we think? Type in the chat, come off mute. It is not okay to not respond. <laughs> Don't leave me hanging. What do we think? How long does it take for a kid to get help after they've started to experience a mental health problem? Liz is on the board, six to nine months. Kim says four years. Chris, three months. Karen, one year, six months. Tim is no Pollyanna here, 10 years. Uh, Casey, five years. Joan, eight to 12 months. Tim, you are the blue ribbon winner, eight to 10 years. Does that shock people? Are you, are you aware of this statistic? I've seen actually some research that points at 11 plus years recently. Um, this is no joke. This is why we screen. We've got to get ahead of problems, look for emerging concerns, and act proactive and preventive services. Waiting eight to 10 years to get to a, to a point where you can get services is a terrible public health model. We can be proactive and preventative. We don't have to wait for diagnosis and crisis. And CELUS is a part of that. When we see lagging skill development, we can react to that. Thanks for your participation. I appreciate that. Why do we do this stuff? Well, I just said a lot of this, right? Fosters early identification, allows for us to understand competence of our students relative to our social emotional learning curriculum. We are the mental health systems prevention arm, period. No one else is coming to the table to do this kind of work. So we have to take that seriously. Early identification does reduce instances of crisis. We get to provide preventative care, get ahead of problems. It's also the case that we found that there was a 63% increase in the number of students that presented or that qualified for services for internalizing concerns after we started screening. So it told me a couple things, right? We're doing something right. We're finding kids through parent referral, teacher referral. We had other systems in place, but without screening, without things like CELUS and mental health screening, we were missing a giant portion of our population that needed services. What does that translate to? Well, eight to 10 years of wait time. That's what it translates to. This is how we use CELUS. Now, right now, we're primarily using our CELUS data um, at the aggregate level. We want to get to a point where we're starting to use the SWAN maps more often. But I think that this is a call out to one of the applications of these data sets, which is to understand the aggregate needs of our kids. Love knowing that 56% of our kids have developed social emotional competence, 13% highly developed. 30% developing, but you know we're moving in the right direction. This is an indication of growth. This is an indication that what we're doing to target social emotional competence is working for most. Satisfied? Well, no, we have to keep moving. And I'm very curious about the 31% that have lagging skill development and what specifically are those lagging skills and how do we target those? This is a view of the uh, subgroup data. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate, appreciate about these data sets is that um, it helped us to understand the degree to which we're providing equitable social emotional learning instructional opportunities. Are we doing a good job of putting social emotional learning opportunities in front of all of our kids? And is it moving the dial on their social emotional competence in a way that does not produce disproportionate data sets? And we found that 
That was actually true. We were, we were really excited about that. Um, is it perfectly true? No, and we have to make some adjustments and we have to be mindful of uh, equity at, at every step of the, of, uh, in our journey, but, um, but we're not seeing large gaps. We're not seeing moderate to, to large gaps. Um, I think it was overall a really good indication that we were able to provide equitable access to these opportunities um, for the vast majority of kids. Again, not satisfied until it's all the way. I told you I was going to talk about scale. I'm going to talk about scale real quick and then pass the mic. But I think it's important that we remember that not everyone's going to be able to onboard CELIS or any screening measure all at once with their entire population. One student, one measure, one day was how we got to screening our entire population over time. This was our first attempt. When you screen one kid, you learn an awful lot about screening. You learn about selection of measure, how to administer and score that measure, consent procedures, data warehousing, how to interpret the scores. All kinds of information is gained by screening one kid. You don't have to screen 2,000 kids to get this experience. This allows for you to bring it to scale safely and adjust your practice relative to scale over time. And it looks a little bit like micro level testing in the beginning, ad hoc testing of practices in the beginning, and then engaging in good cycles of inquiry, good plan, do, study, act cycles for continuous improvement so that you can react to the changes in the scale of your implementation and improve your implementation over time. Think of this as plan one, one kid, one measure, one day. This is five kids, this is 10, this is a classroom. And as you bring it to scale over time, you're reacting to and learning about your implementation such that you can make adjustments to practice like this. Active consent, moving to passive consent because I'm not chasing down 250 active consent forms. I could with two kids, no big deal. But once we get to a certain scale, we have to adjust our practice. Paper and pencil screening with one kid, sure, no big deal. I can score that all day long. Web-based screening for 2,000 kids, yeah, you got it. I hope that makes sense. If you are looking for resources for screening, here are some resources for screening. There's an implementation guide, a resource guide. We have ready-made measures, all kinds of templates with language, other resources. And here's how you contact me. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be able to present today and, and show you how Celis um, nests into our larger screening program. Thanks, John. Is there MD, any questions for John? All right. We will move forward. Um, next up is um, Dr. Chris Lord from Peabody. And uh, I think if you just share your screen, you should be okay. Well, thanks, everybody. I think what's really wonderful about this is how each of us have taken the same seeds and grown them in different gardens across the state. I mean, it's really cool. Um, I'll just do a little, you know, mock to flyby of how uh, PBD has done their sealess work over the last uh, couple of years. Let me share my screen up here. How's it look? Thumbs up, Sheila, am I presenting? Good. Cool. Yes, you're oh, okay. Uh, we, uh, we applied for this a few years ago, uh, successful in getting our grant, and we immediately established a team. We have 10 schools, well, actually now 11. We have one virtual school now, mine, that I'm running. Um, and so now this is how our history is, um, and this is what we've done this past year, and this is where we're headed for the future. I'm hoping you can pick that up in the next eight minutes or so. Um, last summer, we sat down with last spring's CELIS data, and it very quickly became apparent that social emotional learning was the most important thing for our city. So all of our schools set to putting together school improvement plans, including our district improvement plan, that really looked at improving the social emotional health of all of our kids. 
<clears throat> we had uh, guided screening records um, individually um, each of the buildings. I can share with you how that worked. Uh, we had individual individual interventions based on that information uh, that we got from CELUS. Uh, the SWAN maps, um, they are starting to grow in the conversation for IEP meetings, 504 and ISTs. Uh, and we do something different. Um, CELUS is the student's perspective of themselves and their own social emotional health. Uh, we have a uh, vision of the graduate here at Peabody. And for the last five years or so, we've been measuring not only ABCDF on report cards at the high school, but also a degree of proficiency with which students are meeting seven competencies in the vision of the graduate. One of those seven competencies is self-management. So uh, we have school-wide, now district-wide rubrics that measure self-management from all homeroom teachers. So we not only have the student's perspective with respect to uh, social emotional health, we also have the teacher's perspective of their students and their social emotional health. So we have uh, kind of this running record, some of you have mentioned that, uh, from not only the student perspective, but also teacher perspective. And we can use that information going forward to make interventions as needed. When we looked at the self-manager data last year, perseverance is one of the things that we measured. And that was the number one thing we focused on. We try to keep it simple here in PBD, couple of goals, that's it. And try to do really good things with a couple of goals. These are the things that we put in place uh, for this past year. Um, our team, again, we had two or three person team at every one of our buildings that managed all the data, trained all the staff on CASEL indicators, uh, the three signature best practices uh, with Deb Brady. She was excellent. We did some training on that. And again, the walk away for teachers was try these three things every day in the classroom. This should improve the social emotional health. Start with a positive thing. End with a positive thing. And honestly, I can't remember what the third one was, but there's one in the middle. Anyway, there's three best said that your best practices that, uh, that Deb shared with us and our teams shared that at their faculty meetings. Um, we have a wonderful organization at PBD called the PBD Education Foundation. They provided uh, social emotional learning libraries with books to read on you pick the social emotional issue at hand. This is um, you know on-demand learning. If uh, there's a bullying incident, there's little books on learning. If there's stress, there's little books on stress. So the kindergarten through fifth grade students all had these libraries that the teachers could grab and read a story to the kids about how to deal with anxiety or stress. Uh, if anyone has, raise your hand if you've seen Rob Hero, uh, Rob uh, Surrett, Hero Art, anybody seen him? This guy is unbelievable. He's one of the 25 Disney artists who's paid to stay at home and paint Yoda and you all Marvel comics. The guy is amazing. And he'll go to your school for 1200 bucks and put on a one hour show that will just blow you away. This guy has been on Oprah. This, this guy has been on uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger on the Today Show. Look him up, Rob Surrett, Hero Art. He lives in North Andover. And he just, he goes to schools for fun. He works for 40 hours a week for Disney. Uh, that's how he makes his money. But he just wants to go into schools and do hero art painting. You'll see some of the work he does if you go online, look at his YouTube. We brought him into all of our schools, except for the high school, he was great. Um, some of you already mentioned how you focused on uh, CELIS data in your advisories in the high school. Our advisories did that this year. And Norm Basio, a great comedian, uh, he came and um, did a wonderful, more uh, grown-up presentation uh, for our high school students to hopefully improve social emotional learning. This is our results. The blue is the fall scores for the district in self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationships, goals, responsible decision making, and every single one of them went up. This is, um, I think it was 60 or 70% of our student body from grades three through grade 12. Um, it's an overhead view of how it looked, um, but it seemed to do some good things for us. Uh, this data was a way for us to measure the social emotional health of our kids, and, and that's the way it, it worked. When we got boots on the ground, I pulled out the specific data, but this is how we observe our CELIS data. Here's all of our schools. Our schools have all their own visual for their own kids and their own data. I can show you mine, I've gotten permission from my staff and my students to show you what ours looks like. This was our overall scores last fall and the color coordination. Each one of these lines is a different student. Uh, this student needs a rope. Uh, a lot of red in there. This is how we identified our kids. The guidance counselors went through this, scanned it very quickly, looked at it last fall and said, 
hmm, this kid's here probably going to be a, a leader in that classroom. And it's helpful for the homeroom teachers to know this. Uh, there's some red in here. We want to talk to these four kids. Anyway, the guidance counselors scanned every kid quickly at the beginning of the year and made interventions. That was last fall. Here's the data this spring for, and this is just the virtual kids, the kids at the virtual school. Uh, we had a huge jump in our social emotional construct overall, social awareness, uh, self-awareness went up, self-management went up, self-awareness, relationship, all of these scores went up from last fall to this spring. So really happy about the kids in our virtual world. Um, the data is similar in the in-person buildings with the exception of one elementary school. Um, we're trying to figure out why that went down, but that was the results that you saw on that earlier slide that had the, um, this one right here that had those big jumps. So we've had some really great increases this year. We want to continue that trajectory. And that's how we got it by each of our teams looking at their schools, looking at their individual kids um, and uh, trying to figure out who needed to get some help. This is the teacher's perspective of social emotional health. Again, the school-wide, now district-wide rubric for self-management we've been using. And we measure, again, perseverance, respect, strengths and struggles, uh, strategy routines, and healthy lifestyle. And this is an observation of the homeroom teacher over the course of time, uh, over the course of the year. And this is our kindergarten through eighth graders. There's a little jump in perseverance right here. I'm not sure it's statistically significant, but it looks like it went for about 2.8 to 2.85 or something like that. So that's one of the ones we were trying to focus on, get the kids to be persistent. The um, way this data rolls out for our schools is here. Again, this is all set up. Here are our schools along the bottom. Uh, we pull all this data out of Aspen. Our teachers put this in just like MCAS scores or you said, talked about data warehousing. Um, this data, we, we keep all of it in Aspen. And this, and this stuff uh, on self-management is kept in Aspen. Here's our overall scores for last spring. For those five different areas, here it is by grade level. Here's a comparison of each grade level from last spring to last fall to the spring. Here are the total comparisons. And here's the average by school. You can see some of the schools are doing pretty well. I'm real proud of PVD prep. According to the teacher's perspective, the self-management skills of our PVD prep kids are right up there, one of the best in the city, which is, which is awesome. Um, we did a nice correlation. I want to uh, thank Sheila for this. This is beyond my uh, pay grade, <laughs> but Sheila put together a comparative analysis of the student's perspective of their own self-management with the teacher's perspective of their own self-management. And as you can see, for our seventh graders, this is based on last spring's data. For our seventh graders, uh, the teachers and the kids are seeing themselves pretty similarly uh, when the kids self-assess with self-management and when the teachers self-assess with self-management. So all those little dots showed us a nice little correlation, at least with the seventh grade group. Um, this is what we're planning. Our, our CLIS team and I'm sorry, our SEL team met uh, last week. And again, we have two or three people in each building. We're having a big meeting uh, with all the principals in about two weeks. How will your CLIS and self-managed data inform school improvements for next year? When will the guidance staff review the latest CLIS results? The SWAN maps, are they of value and how will you use them? How will you get them to your homeroom teachers? So your homeroom teachers next year will get a portrait of the students walking in on the first day. And again, how will the self-managed data be presented to the homeroom teacher? So that's where each of our schools is going. They're gonna answer it all in different ways. They all, each team has a different place, very similar to how we did it here. Everybody had a different way of using the CLIS data that was, was of value to them. So we're giving kind of some general guidance to the, to the SEL teams at each building and they're gonna use that to, um, to guide their conversation. And how did I do, Sheila? Trying to get before four o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, oh, any questions? Do you have any? Uh, yes. Any questions for Dr. Lord or anybody else? I'm just going to share, I think I can share something if I can share my screen. 
Um, I thought uh, Dr. Lord was going to show a Swan map. I just want you to see the. Oh, right. No, it's all right. I de identified Swan maps here. So, this is kind of the view that a teacher could possibly get. Um, she'll get all her students that have the student's name in their classroom. Um, and basically, you click on the student and you get the uh, SWAN map. And as Melissa was saying, you just hover over the item and it tells you the, um, you know, what the student's responding to. So this student, in this case, um, the one after the identification for the item is saying that the student responded this uh, was hard for the student. So catching up on my work when I get behind was hard for the student. And you can see it, the, each of the SWAN map tells a story and so self-awareness seems to be you know uh, the areas for growth for the student but if you look up here look at all the uh, strengths the student has or per perceives they have they're particularly along self-management skills so but I just wanted to show you that this is the you know the, the more interactive version of, of this one map so yeah thanks Sheila I got to say the the team that sh sh that saw these swan maps at PBD, they thought this was the greatest thing since sliced bread. I'm already doing a presentation to the um, uh, the team chairs for special ed next week on how to interpret them. So thank you. Right. Oh, I think uh, there's any other questions or anybody, or we can call this to a close. I personally would really like to thank all the presenters i really appreciate you taking the time to do this because i know it's crazy you're coming to the end of the school year and um you probably just want to get on your summer vacation <laughs> but um i really appreciate you taking the time to do this and uh, uh i will be posting the recording on the salus web page and um a, you know some other stuff, the slides and stuff like that on the sales web page. So thanks so much, everybody. I appreciate it. And I want to thank the interpreters uh, as well, Anna and Susan, for um, helping out with the presentation. It's much appreciated. All right, and Kate. I forgot you, Kate. Thank you, Kate, for helping me. <laughs> All right, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.